Good morning, and welcome to our Unitarian Universalist Cooperative Summer Worship Series for 2020. I'm Kendall Gibbons, Senior Minister at the All Souls UU Church in Kansas City, Missouri. When our congregations pivoted suddenly to online worship back in March, in response to the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, we all had to invent new formats and adapt to new technologies instantly. Many of our ministers and tech staff and volunteers rose to the occasion with great creativity and skill. Now, during our traditional summer break and study time, we take this opportunity to share our discoveries and learn from each other through a series of virtual visits to Sunday services with a cluster of our neighbor congregations. Through the gift of online worship, you will hear from some of our newest up and coming young preachers and some of our wisest senior colleagues. You will experience how a variety of congregations have embraced the challenges of these new formats and our sound, video, and streaming tech folks will enjoy a little well-deserved time off. Look for our separate community online gatherings to resume in September. We hope that today's message will rouse your spirit and resonate with your soul. Good morning. I am the Reverend Kevin W. Jago, and I'd like to welcome you to Bucksmont Unitarian Universalist Fellowship's online worship, where, moved by love, we share lifelong journeys of growth, wonder, and healing, nurturing wholeness in society and spirit, creating a community of justice and compassion. I'd like to give a warm welcome to everyone joining us online today, members, friends, and those who may be newcomers to our communities this morning. An extra special welcome to the congregations who have shared in the creation of our summer collaborative services. Whether you are worshiping in Kansas City, Missouri, Rockford, Illinois, Columbus, Ohio, Lawrence, Kansas, Topeka, Kansas, Lincoln, Nebraska, Manhattan, Kansas, or near our own home base of Warrington, Pennsylvania, know that you are welcome in the larger circle of our fellowship this week and any week. If you are new to Unitarian Universalism, I invite you to check out our National Association's website, www.uua.org or the congregation's website you are visiting today. If you would like to know more about the community that I serve, Bucksmont UU Fellowship, you can find us online at www.buxmontuu.org. Whether you are a guest, friend, or member, we are glad you are a part of our worship service today. Come. Let us worship together.
As we sit at keyboards or with mobile screens almost anywhere, we are all together. Those watching now on Sunday and those who may be watching months from now, we are joined together for worship across both space and time. This is a free, creedless religious congregation in the discipline of truth and the spirit of universal kinship, we join together in a cooperative quest for religious and ethical values, seeking to apply these values to the development of character, enrichment of the spirit, and service to all. You are welcome here, whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever the color of your skin or your country of origin, no matter your gender expression or gender identity, whatever your age, however you define family, wherever you are at this time, and whatever the source of your faith, you are welcome here. This Sunday, we kindle our Unitarian Universalist chalice with words adapted from Betsy Dar. May the light of this chalice give light and warmth to our community. When we are joyful and when we despair, and may we feel the warmth spread from our circle to wider and wider circles until all know they belong to the one circle of life. Please light your chalice. Our common chalice is now lit. Please join me in singing hymn number 346. Come, sing a song with me. Before I introduce our Time for All Ages, I wanted to share that you may notice my band-aid in some of our videos for today's service. I had a minor accident between recordings, but all is well now. For our Time for All Ages today, 
we will hear from some of the youngest members of our community about what it means to have individuals do their small part to help in the health and healing of the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. Their project and the story they bring to share with us today both highlight how our seventh principle ties us together in networks of mutuality and how that mutuality means we have a responsibility to do whatever we can, wherever we are, to help one another. I'm Melina. And I'm Daniel. And, and this, this is, is our rain, rain garden. garden. Okay. The rain comes from our gutter into these stones and into our rain garden. Before we had our rain garden, the water used to flow down to the street where it collected pollutants. The roots of our rain garden help prevent erosion and naturally filter the water. They also have flowers to feed the bees and butterflies. Milkweed, salvia, black-eyed Susan. Many people in our town have rain gardens. It is nice to know that we are helping people in our community take care of the environment. The Wangari Mahatai brought communities in Africa together to help the environment and themselves. She was the first environmentalist to win the Nobel Peace Prize. This is her story. Wangari's Trees of Peace, a true story from Africa, by Jeanette Winter. Wangari lives under an umbrella of green trees in the shadow of Mount Kenya in Africa. She watches the birds in the forest where she and her mother go to gather firewood for cooking. And she helps harvest the sweet potatoes, sugarcane, and maize from the rich soil. Wangari shines in school. And when she grows tall, like the trees in the forest, she wins a scholarship to study in America. Six years later, her studies over, Wangari returns to her Kenya home and sees a change. What has happened, she wonders. Where are the trees? Wangari sees women bent from hauling firewood miles and miles from home. She sees barren land where no crops got grow. And where are the birds? Thousands of trees have been cut down to make room for buildings, but no one planted new trees to take their place. Will all of Kenya become a desert? She wonders as her tears fall. Wangari thinks about the barren land. I can begin to replace some of the lost trees here in my own backyard, one tree at a time. She starts by planting nine seedlings. Watching the seedlings take root gives Wangari the idea to plant more, to start a farm for baby trees, a nursery, in an open space, she plants row after row of the tiny trees. Next, Wangari convinces the village woman that planting trees is a good thing. She gives each one a seedling. Our lives will be better when we have trees again. You'll see. We are planting the seeds of hope. The women spread out over their village, planting tiny trees in long rows like a green belt stretching over the land. The government men laugh. Women can't do this, they said. It takes trained foresters to plant trees. The women get, ignore the laughter and keep planting. Bungari pays them a small amount for each seedling still living after three months their first earnings ever. 
word travels, like wind rustling through leaves about the green returning to Wangari's village. Soon other women in villages and towns and cities in Kenya are planting long rows of seedlings too. But the cutting continues. Wangari stands tall as an oak to protect the old trees still remaining. We need a park more than we need an office tower. Way more. The government men disagree. Wangari blocks their way, so they hit her with clubs. They call her a troublemaker and put her in jail. And still, she stands tall. Right is right, even if you're alone. But Wangari is not alone. Talk of the tree spreads all spreads over all of Africa, like ripples in Lake Victoria. More women hear the talk and plant even more seedlings in longer and longer rows. The seedlings take root and grow tall until there are over 30 million trees where there were none. The umbrella of green in Kenya returns. Women walk tall, their backs straight, for now they can gather firewood closer to home. The land is no longer barren. Sweet potatoes, sugarcane, and maize grow again in the rich red earth. The whole world hears of Wangari's trees and of her army of women who planted them. And if you were to climb to the very top of Mount Kenya today, you would see the millions of trees growing below you and the green Wangari brought back to Africa. The end. The offering in liberal religion is a vital part of our history of faith. As a covenanted community, people who freely choose to be here, our voluntary giving is symbolic of that freedom of choice. I invite you to join in the offering to your local congregation in support of its mission and the good we can make possible together through the communities we make real by showing up, by supporting them, and by helping create the programming that shares our Unitarian Universalist values with one another and the world. As we give today, both to our congregations and the communities that surround them, let us be as generous as possible within our means and take pleasure in the good that our giving will do. We will now receive the morning offering.
for these gifts and what they represent to our congregations and community, we are truly grateful. We dedicate these gifts as we affirm our lives in community. Let us now enter into a time of awareness within ourselves and connection beyond boundaries, connection to one another, to that interdependent web of life of which we are but one small thread. As we breathe in, we are connected. As we breathe out, we are connected. As we settle into this time, we recall that ours is a faith and a tradition that calls us to draw the circle ever wider. I invite you into a spirit of meditation and prayer. You may close your eyes if you wish and join me in holding that which we bring with us to let go of what we may and to know that within the circle of community, we are not alone in the holding nor the letting go. We help and are helped by being present with others. Though our presence is different these days, it is important nonetheless. As we breathe together across physical distance but emotional nearness, I share the words of a favorite poet, Mary Oliver, for us to imagine together. When I lived under the black oaks, I felt I was made of leaves. When I lived by little sister pond, I dreamed I was the feather of the blue heron left on the shore. I was the pond lily, my root delicate as an artery, my face like a star, my happiness brimming. Later, I was the footsteps that follow the sea. I knew the tides. I knew the ingredients of the rack. I knew the aider, the red-throated loon, with his uplifted beak and his smart eyes. I felt I was the tip of the wave, the pearl of water on the aider's glossy back. No, there's no escaping, nor would I want to escape. This ongoing, this foot loosening, this solution to gravity and a single shape. Now I am here. Later, I will be there. I will be that small cloud staring down at the water. The one that stalls, that lifts its white legs, that looks like a lamb. Life Story by Mary Oliver. May we be wherever we may be and know that it is enough. As we breathe in, we are connected. As we breathe out, we are connected. May our minds create a vision of the world radical enough to be called holy. May our actions contain the promise of hope and the commitment to justice. May our hearts remember that love is a power that resists all forms of fear. By our thoughts, by our actions, by our hearts, and by our very breath, May it be so. Good morning. I invite you to sing with me a version of Shall We Gather by the River. In 1989, I wrote these words after our fellowship made a difficult decision to change from many years of lay leadership and to seek a minister. I've always loved the old hymn, but it did not fit our very humanist congregation at that time. We often gather by our river, 
The Little Neshaminy Creek flows just past the willow tree on the other side of the gardens behind me. Please join me in singing, raising our voices in community. From the Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams. The skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath, and most of the hairs of his tail had been pulled out to string bead necklaces. He was wise for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger, and by and by break their mainsprings and pass away. And he knew that they were only toys, and would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful, and those playthings that are old and wise and experienced like the skin horse, understand all about it. What is real? asked the rabbit one day, when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time. 
not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up? he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. I suppose you are real, said the rabbit, and then he wished he had not said it, for he thought the skin horse might be sensitive. But the skin horse only smiled. The boy's uncle made me real, he said. That was a great many years ago, but once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always.
together, my friend. This is not the way I planned for today to happen. I've been thinking that a lot lately. I am someone who relies heavily on planning, on being organized, and on achieving the things I set out to accomplish. And yet life is not something easily put into a spreadsheet or a bulleted list of to-do items. We use those tools to help us sketch out a path toward our goals, but the actual lived experience never quite fits into the pre-planned outline, does it? Even when we tick all the boxes and the balance sheet reads the way we'd hoped, if we are honest with ourselves, it didn't go exactly according to plan. Well, the past five or so months have underscored this lack of control in stark ways. My colleague, the Reverend Melissa Carville Zemer, recently wrote in a message to UU ministers that though the size and shape of our individual losses vary widely, we all have so many losses in this time of pause and change in our daily patterns, which continue to unfold. None of us planned for today to look as it does. And yet we are creating new ways to be in the midst of the loss. That is how grief works too. Our lives are not the same after loss. We do not go back to the way things were, but the transformed lives continue on to create new and different paths forward. We have all moved into new patterns in our daily lives. We have moved into new patterns in our households, in our shopping, in our workplaces, and we have moved into new patterns in our congregations. We experience those patterns each Sunday, and particularly over this summer experiment we've all taken part in. At Bucksmont UU Fellowship, where I serve, we have seen some new ways to gather growing over the spring and summer. Community circles, virtual musical gatherings, craft times over Zoom, and the many, many meetings, too. There are even physical cards made out of paper, letters, and phone calls happening at greater rates. And then there are all the personal connections being made between members and beyond with their families and friends. We've shifted in how we meet, but I would say we've been spending more time together, not less. I've heard from a number of people that they are seeing family and friends more in re recent weeks than in previous whole years. Distance and geographies have collapsed, along with our sense of time a bit. The days seem to be harder to tell apart, but the memories created seem to stand out even without the context of which day of the week it happens to be. And it is time well spent, the precious moments of in-person, socially distanced time, and the special times that we are able to share with the click of a Zoom link, 
both help fill me with that sense of connectedness. And we are forming new ways to do that with the people closer to home too. Perhaps they are actually in our homes with us or a trusted neighbor or a small bubble of people that you are spending time with in person that have similar interests and vectors to you. Like in our Time for All Ages today, we see the projects happening at home to make our values come alive where we are spending the majority of our days changing the backyards and front yards, the quality time on porches and couches, the puzzles and the home-cooked meals, games and movies shared, or new hobbies undertaken that we've always meant to get to if we had the time. The small acts that happen where we are can impact larger and larger circles. One rain garden can become tens and then hundreds as others add their small parts to the whole. Then suddenly water patterns are shifted and floodplains can change. Mountains are re-greened. We feel as though we are made of leaves under the black oaks or become one with the tip of a wave. We begin to imagine what it means to be real. Our interdependent web at work. Socially, when we connect to one another, isolation is, is lessened. But it is not only the person we reach out to who is helped. It is us, too. Whether we share a conversation with someone in the same room or in dozens of rooms spread out over a city, a state, or the globe, each word shared is not a unidirectional act. It quickly becomes a circuit, a conversation, a network of relationships that add up to more than the individual pieces ever could. New ideas are created, psyches are nurtured, and tasks that seemed impossible suddenly become achievable. In other words, the connections become communities. Communities of care, of support, of social change, of healing, of lament, of resilience. They become real community. I do not think we often set out to do these sorts of things intentionally. On rare occasions, we may begin with a clear vision of why we gather. But more often, I believe we gather, we connect to others because it is in our nature to do so. We are not whole when we are on our own, so we seek out others, and it can feel a bit random at times, unless we reflect on our actions and use the, those imperfect tools like lists, schedules, and spreadsheets to help find our direction together. We've had older tools at our disposal too, things like stories and games to make connections when we are together, to lower social barriers and find shared meaning, shared joy. We've also had things like music and art, poetry and jokes, all are ways to help us make those connection ha connections happen when we find ourselves around a campfire or a dinner table, in a sanctuary or at a picnic, on a date or a Zoom happy hour, in a Facebook group or on a patio speaking to friends more than six feet away. The context of our connections have shifted a bit more suddenly than we'd planned but they continue to be made nonetheless. But what about a sense of community? Does it exist now? Has it lessened or strengthened in our lives? I think our friend, the skin horse, can help us with that. Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. 
He goes on to say, it doesn't happen all at once. You become. It takes a long time. The boy's uncle made me real, he said. That was a great many years ago. But once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. It lasts for always. As we found our way into the congregations we now call ours, that sense of belonging didn't happen all at once either. It took time, like a cup filling drop by drop. It wasn't the first handshake or hug, it, the first welcome or conversation. Maybe it wasn't the hundredth either. But there was likely a point at which it became real community for us. And after it happened, it was hard to point to the exact moment that it became real, but it had, and it can't be undone easily. Just like the best kind of relationships, you start as strangers, meeting and beginning something new. Then there are, the, then there are all the small little things that build up over days and weeks and years, and suddenly that stranger is a friend, a beloved, someone who helps make your world a better place. A real relationship and a real community can happen in all sorts of ways. So I'm not entirely sure I can give a diagnostic list of what makes a community real or a relationship real, but I do know this. They can be begun and nurtured and made deeper, regardless of whether we first connect in person or online, by letter sent through the mail, text message, or physical contact, sharing a meal across a table or a story across a continent. This may not be how we planned for today to happen, but that doesn't mean we should let it slip away from us either. We have the opportunity here and now to make community real, to make real connections and real congregations, ones that will last for always, no matter how we make them. So may it be. and spirits to a faith set free from here. When the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion mean to call us on our way, when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within, our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin. From the stories of our living rings a song both brave and free, calling pilgrims still to witness to the life of liberty. When the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion mean to call us on our way, when we live with brief assurance of the flame that burns within, then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can be from the dreams of youthful vision comes a new prophetic voice which demands a deeper justice built by our courageous choice when the power of commitment 
sets our mind and soul ablaze. When our hunger and our passion meet to call us on our way. When we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within. Then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can be Our chalice extinguishing words are adapted from Albert Schweitzer. At times our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. May we carry the spark within us and continue to rekindle those we meet. As our community departs from this service, may we remember all who came before. May we imagine all who will come after. May we honor all who are present with us here and now. In our time together, we create this community, one of promise, one of commitment. In our time together, may each of us become a sanctuary for all we meet on the journey. May we go together now and return again. Mm -hmm.